Okay. Hello, everybody. So I'm here again with Pharaoh Hazard, and together we are going to talk about um, a film called The Vast of Night, which is like this sort of uh, sci-fi drama um, that like was sort of an Amazon exclusive. So yeah, we'll get to talking about that. So um, so how was your week? Did you uh, get a chance to see anything cool or any, any kind of sci-fi stuff in the last week or so since we did our last episode? Uh, not really, no. I mean, this was honestly like the highlight of my viewing experience. Um, I, I work a lot at nights, so when I get home, oh, I can yeah. turn on a show that's going to make me fall asleep. Um, so no, unfortunately. <laughs> um, okay. How about you? Uh, I've been watching, I haven't been watching a lot of sci-fi recently. I did watch this one movie that I kind of had heard about that was a little obscure, this movie called Threads. So this movie was a sort of docudrama about what would happen if there was a nuclear war in like the 80s. And it was about this town in England and pretty much there's an escalating conflict that happens in the Middle East because Russians invade which leads to a nuclear conflict. And it's just like, what would happen to people if that were to happen? And it was, it was very intense, very harrowing. And, you know, it's not good. <laughs> it's no, not it's, good for people. It's not going to be good no matter what. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the crazy thing about, you know, those kind of stories is that the people who are lucky are the people who just die right away. Mm. Because if you just die right away, okay, that's it. It's over. Um, but if you're someone who doesn't die or you're like, like they're, they even talked about like, there's, there's like, if you're right at the edge of the impact wave, it's like the worst for you because you, you suffer a lot before you die. Mm -hmm. And like, they go into basically society breaks down. No one can get food or clothing or shelter and the government can't really function. It was a really powerful film. Um, yeah, especially yeah. in some cases, your local governments or your even the higher governments governments might also be destroyed in the process. So you have no leadership to look for. You're lost. You're aimless. Not to mention the vast amount of survivor's guilt you would feel on top of yeah. just trying to survive. Um, yeah, I would go in the blast wave. That's fine with me. I, I, <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, totally. I mean, it. You know, the survivor's guilt. That's a that's definitely a good thing to bring up because like you see this world where, you know, I mean, just the, the environmental impacts alone, like the, basically there's not really day anymore because there's all this stuff in the atmosphere. Okay. And so that's probably going to make you depressed. And then the, the winters are extremely cold. So, you know, human beings can only take so much before they kind of check out. You know? Yeah. I always felt like there was, there weren't enough, um, crazies in like post nuclear apocalyptic movies. Like there's always that one like semi sane guy or level headed people. I'm like no, we would all literally snap. Like yeah. your brain can only handle so much trauma to the point where it's just you can't yeah. function. You can't. Yeah, like, yeah, I don't think people would. It would be like yeah. Mad Max. <laughs> like everyone yeah. would be just insane. Yeah, and Mortem Joe, and I forget who the guy from the second movie was. Just these, you know, I mean, because that's that's all that's left. It it becomes becomes anarchy. Like you mm -hmm. just whoever's the strongest, the most powerful is gonna create a new hierarchy. Survival of the fittest, and I am not all that fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I saw a while back you tweeted that you and your boyfriend you you showed him Terminator Two for the first time, right? I did. So, but, and he had not seen Terminator 1. He had no idea Arnold was the bad guy in the first movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, how did that go? Um, pretty good. He actually really liked it. He um, doesn't usually watch sci-fi or anything like that. So, when he started laughing out loud when we watched the Orville, I was actually really surprised. Because, like I said, he fell asleep during Star Trek Discovery mm -hmm. multiple times. And the Orville has kept his attention. But the Terminator, he was... He didn't understand why John Connor was afraid of the Terminator or why mm -hmm. Sarah Connor had her reaction. And finally, I just couldn't keep it in anymore. And I was like, it's because yeah. he was the bad guy in the first movie. Mm -hmm. He was like, mm -hmm. what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was really sweet, actually. Um, but no, he really liked it. Um, he thought the T-1000 was cool. 
Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, it, it went over very well. I don't know cool. how he would handle the first movie because he doesn't necessarily like older movies. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think he would enjoy it personally. I think he'd like Kyle Reese. Yeah, I think I think both of those films are like Terminator Two is an amazing film. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it's one of the most perfect action films ever made. And yeah, I, I definitely thought that you know the the Arnold thing would be a little confusing because yeah you wouldn't know that he's a villain they do kind of try to tell you but obviously it seems like that doesn't the the story stuff they they did maybe doesn't process like there's a scene where Sarah Connor they bring her in with the psychiatrist and the police show her his picture mm -hmm. you know like and oh they yeah give this it exposition and stuff like that mm -hmm. is really good it's like oh this guy who who killed an entire police station he's back. Do you know anything about it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, and she doesn't say anything and just takes a paperclip. <laughs> exactly. Um, um, which Ryan is a stickler for like um, accuracy in films and stuff like that. Like especially action movies and how people hold mm -hmm. their gun or use their gun and stuff like that. Because mm -hmm. he's, um, he, he owns a few guns, so he knows how to hold one and handle one. Um, and when she took the paperclip, he's like, they better do this right. Like he muttered in her face, like they, she better pick that lock correctly. Mm -hmm. And I told him, well, you know, um, Lyndall Ham Hamilton, Hamilton actually spent time learning how to pick locks mm -hmm. using only a paper clip. And when he saw her like learning or using it, he's like, okay, that was good. <laughs> good. Yeah. The other thing that I think would be a little confusing too is like the stuff with the, with the robotic hand of the Terminator from Terminator one, where she basically, um, uh, she knows that's how they're creating the technology, but yeah. she didn't confirm it. She it, it was a conspiracy theory in her head, but then, you know, Dyson's like, yeah, we, we found this hand. We didn't know what it was, but it was way beyond the scope of uh, our understanding of the technology, and we then used it to basically replicate uh, Skynet. And that's, that's something that I think really comes down to also <clears throat> editing, because if those scenes were in any other order, it would have been very confusing to someone who has seen the first movie also to someone who hasn't seen the first movie um i think a lot of it does come down to the perfect flow of the scenes and the perfect flow of the film and just to go back to like not knowing if arnie was the villain in the first movie i think maybe an audience member might just be you know giving this kid some benefit of the doubt that he's running from a giant man with a gun <laughs> and yeah, a cop yeah. because john is also a, a minor criminal um so it would make sense he would run from either one of these guys mm -hmm. um, yeah that scene is like very underrated i feel like he like the scene when when it's john connor and then he sees the t-1000 and, the, and the he hallway. sees arnold yeah like if you if you don't really know a lot about if okay so if all you know is that arnold was the villain in the first movie you wouldn't know what's going to happen in that scene. No, right? it was, it's it's very suspenseful because you kind of get a sense that the T-1000 isn't entirely holy and he isn't entirely good or, or bad either because mm -hmm. we're supposed to look to cops as, yeah. you know, someone Protectors. To, yeah. to protect us. Um, not so much then because it was the 90s and obviously not so much now. Yeah. Um, but... You know, again, he's not hurting any of the other kids he's interacting with. It's not until he throws John Connor's friend that you're kind of like, okay, yep. this is getting a little freaky. You also know yeah. that he's not an actual cop, but mm -hmm. it's also a good yeah. reveal that he's an entirely different Terminator. Yeah, yeah. It's the things he does are so good, but they kind of get lost in the shuffle. I, I feel like, because I remember when I saw that, I saw that movie a lot as a kid and probably like, probably younger than I should have. I, I was maybe <laughs> like, yeah, it's like, cause you know, it's interesting. It's, it's rated R, but it's not a hard R. <clears throat> I would say it's a hard R. I feel like there's mm -hmm. way more movies that came after it that took it yeah. to another level that should have been rated something else beyond R. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, the, the worst thing was like that scene when the T-1000 um, is, is with his, with John's like, step family or whatever mm -hmm. foster family and then he like kills the dad that that was pretty intense but the rest is just sort of your generic action movie stuff yeah um but yeah like that that scene that scene is so brilliant 
so brilliant because you don't know you, you it could be it could there could be a universe where they're both there to kill him, right exactly like we the audience member is just as confused as john is quite frankly in that scene and i love that brief pause right before arnie says get down mm -hmm. and then you're just like oh, i can't I yeah. wish, if i i wish i could go back in time and see an opening day release of that knowing oh what i God. know about the movie but seeing everyone else's reaction like that's yeah. what i would do if i had a time machine like see yeah, these totally. iconic movies with these twists and watch people's reactions it would totally that'd be like a high for me yeah <laughs> because i i know that experience must have been amazing i wish i could you know? experience it i wish i didn't know also it would be mm -hmm. <sighs> mind-blowing I, I don't know if you saw like avengers endgame in the theater um I didn't, I couldn't bring myself to sit for that yeah. long. I couldn't. Yeah, it's a three hour movie and it's, you know, the first, they basically, they string you along for at least an hour just to make you sit in what they did in, in, in Infinity War. But the, the third act, I'm telling you, like when everyone shows up, like that was one of the greatest moments I've ever experienced with people, like with other human beings. Like it's it, the fervor, the buildup, that moment that like, you know, everyone's excited, everyone's cheering, everyone's crying. Like it's it, mm -hmm. it's crazy. Um, that's what film's about, right? Like that's why we yeah. love it. <laughs> because it's communal. It's, I mean, it's fine yeah. watching a movie by yourself, but at the end of the day, you know, especially when there's a, a great fandom behind it too. The yeah. experience I can attest to that is probably um, Lord of the Rings, Two Towers, because I saw all those movies in theaters because mm -hmm. my yes. uncle took us because he wanted us to see him because he had read the books and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, was when um, they're doing the, I don't remember, but I think they're doing the charge or something like that, but like um, Gandalf the White shows up with yeah. the Riders of Rohan, mm -hmm. you know, King Theoden is not alone yeah. kind of a thing, and, everyone, yeah. and they come down the hill, and Gandalf's mm -hmm. leading it, and his staff is glowing. Oh my god. Yeah, that's great. I yeah. was probably 12 or 13, and I was mm -hmm. just Everyone was losing yeah. their shit. It was great. Those movies are so good. Yeah, because like right before them, they were like, "Oh, we're gonna lose." Yep. And he's like, "Rargon's like, ride with me one last time. Let's ride out. Let's just do a counteroffensive. Let's die fighting." Mm -hmm. Um, and then he remembers, "Oh, on the sunlight on the fourth day or something." Like that. And like, this is the sun. I'm getting chilled. Off. I'm getting I know. And then the sun, and then you see him, and then you see, yeah, you see the other Rohirans, and it's like, dude, they're here. I love the riders of Rohan. Oh my god. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, and then like yeah, Gandalf like he's like right at the right second he like shines the light in their faces so they can't really, mm -hmm. um, so they can't see them and so then they they kind of break their their phalanx and then they just kill them all. <laughs> it was great. I love that moment. It's one of my yeah. favorite Lord of the Rings moments. Yeah, Lord of the Rings miracle, unbelievable miracle. Those three movies. <laughs> thank you, Peter Jackson. Yeah, thank you, Peter Jackson. Okay, so that was our tangent about. <laughs> Terminator to Lord of the Rings. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, so we're going to talk about the film The Vast of Night. So this is, like I said, it's an Amazon exclusive. Um, this was a, like, sort of sci-fi drama film about this small town in Texas. And so it, it has an interesting opening. Like, the beginning of the film, it's, it's like you're seeing a television, and it's like the Paradox Theater. And so, you know, it, it and, and there's a voiceover, too, and it feels very much like you know, Roger Sterling kind of Twilight Zone. Whoever that voice actor was, I genuinely thought it was Roger Sterling. Like yeah. I really, really did. Um, what a great guy. Oh my God. Yeah. I love Roger yeah, Sterling. Totally. He's one of my dad's heroes. <laughs> um, Such a cool I, guy. I, there was a line that, what was it? The mutiny of man or something within that speech. And it was just so good. Like the verbiage of that opening monologue was something I, genuinely did think it was something that they just pulled from the twilight zone to use in this and mm -hmm. it was it was great yeah like like it was like an archive of him yep. speaking unused footage or voice work mm -hmm. or something yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. totally yeah so that's how we're introduced so we gotta get okay we're gonna get this kind of twilight zone ish sci-fi story with maybe some kind of you know moral uh to it so the film opens and it's yeah it's the small town in texas and we're introduced to this guy Everett, who's like a local radio announcer. And there's this basketball game going on, and everyone's interested in watching the game, and everyone's going to the game. And um, he's dealing with all this technical stuff because it seems like he's the only person who knows what to do. 
and we get these you know these fun like small town stuff like everyone keeps talking about this this story about the squirrel that bit squirrel. through a wire it was a chipmunk yeah <laughs> and we hear that story like five times i think in the first 30 minutes of the film yeah every, and it's true that's so how small towns operate too mm -hmm. and it's about a freaking critter in a in the wiring i found it yeah. so course with the wire still on its teeth yeah yeah <laughs> so it. it's kind of yeah we kind of get a sense of like what this what the 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 milieu of this this town is about right um and so then we meet faye and so faye crocker is this um she works um what is it i forget i forget where she works um it's like her it's i think her mom and her share like switchboard operating duties which i love yeah. the whole switchboard operating thing that was really cool that was a nice yeah. touch yeah yeah, so she's a switchboard operator, but she like just got this new like tape recorder and she's like showing like, hey, ever check this out, blah, blah, blah. That's and so he's cute. like, yeah, yeah. He's like, okay, well, why don't you try and use it? Let's interview some people. And so they go around talking to some people and, you know, there's the, the typical squirrel stories and some other wonky, cute stuff. Um, and, you know, we kind of get the sense that these two like have a friendship and they kind of, you know, there's some flirtation there um and then we get this like really long take where they're walking i think sort of somewhere i think either to her job or something like that i think he's just like walking her to where she works pretty much yeah yeah and so then they 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 talk about so faye is like really into like sci-fi stuff and futurism um and she talks about all these different future technologies like um high-speed rail and you know like cellular phones and phones where you can you know talk to someone through the phone well how about and... 1974. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit off but you know um i fi always find it interesting thinking about like how optim because this is like a very optimistic time yes yes people had these you know again star trek comes out 10 years later and it's like hey the future is like awesome and we're gonna be you know 2001 space odyssey which came out in 68 we're going to be like taking Pan Am to the moon. And, you know, people were like really excited about the future. Um, and, you know, we, <laughs> we, we live in that future and we're like, <laughs> be careful what you wish for Faye. Yeah. What, what I find interesting too, is like, so there's something, I don't think that if you told someone about the internet at this time, I think that they wouldn't really understand really. No. Um, and that the internet is the real, is the real thing that has revolutionized human society. Yes. Um, you know, more than what we're doing right now. It, exactly. That. exactly. Without the internet, we, you know, I would never know who you were, right? <laughs> or exactly. vice versa. Um, so yeah, the internet is like an interesting thing, but it's, it's, it's kind of funny that people, there's been a lot of like social revolutions, not really technological revolutions so much um, in terms, you know, in terms of like hard hardware, being able to like um, multiply our ability to, you know, use resources or go to space or things like that. Um, but, you know, like, like thinking about like the, in the 2010s, what was the most important piece of technology was really, I'd say the cell phone, like the, the, the smartphone smartphone was like huge. Cause now everyone has the internet, on a phone that they can also call and do all these other amazing things on. Exactly. It's something that we definitely take for granted every day. I feel yeah, like totally. your cell phone and the internet is probably the most um, um, taken for granted piece of technology that everyone has. Everyone. Yeah. Um, like my mom has it <laughs> in her phone. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a gift and I think it's definitely a curse at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, so at this point, how did you feel about the two main characters, about uh, Faye and Everett? Did, did you have a positive feeling? Did, did, yeah, did, did I you like Everett their... immediately um, because I've, I, I've known so many boys and guys like Everett in my life. Um, I've lived in a lot of small towns, and there's always an Everett. Um, Likeable, he's Mr. Popular, but he's also clearly not without his... Um, like he steals a kid's like tuba and ha or trumpet or whatever and locks it in a locker. <laughs> he never yeah. gives it back. Mm -hmm. um, so he's kind of a, a prankster at the same time. Um, but he 
can fix things. He's nice. He's polite to people. Um, he's polite to Faye. Um, uh, I have, a, I get this feeling that maybe she was probably a freshman when he was a senior or something like that. And he kind of maybe took her under his wing, looked out for her kind of like a little sister almost because she doesn't have a dad. Um, and he, you know, he encourages her and I like that. He's not, there's nothing creepy or nefarious about his relationship with her, which I found incredibly refreshing. There's no ulterior motives. He's just encouraging and nice to her. He doesn't, he doesn't belittle her or something like that. Um, like I love when he tells her, oh, you could go to college. And she's just like, I couldn't do that. And he's like, take out student loans. Just go. Like, yeah. you don't have to stay around here. And mm -hmm. she kind of gives him that little look, almost kind of like, yeah, but you yeah. Live here kind of a thing, you know? Which I thought was Yeah, really yeah, good. yeah. He's like, well, um, yeah, because they have that conversation about, like, you know, he talks about, like, what he wants to do. Like, oh, I, I want to work in radio. And I'd have to like move to the West Coast because that's where all the big radio stuff is. Yeah, and there's this kind of like interplay between the two of them where they, you know, there's there's unspoken. Yeah. Kind of. But it's not take like the the director doesn't take advantage of the relationship, and neither mm -hmm. do the characters. It's just mm -hmm. this. It's just very sweet, and for once, yeah. not done in a creepy way. <laughs> for once. Yeah. You know, that, that they can be friends but have a flirtatious um, relationship as well. But I think they're both smart enough to know how real it, what what their goals are, that they are different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, have you ever seen the movie uh, American Graffiti, the George Lucas movie? Oh, forever ago. Oh, my God. Yeah. My mom, wouldn't she saw it was at the library. We went, rented it on VHS. Wow. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I love that movie. <clears throat> I love that movie. I really do. Uh, and this has the same kind of like this Americana vibes. Like, <clears throat> it doesn't that take place over one night as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It's one night, and then some stuff happens, and then there's sort of a a postscript about sort of the you know some things that happen to some of the characters. Yeah. And and it's also about like you know young people and they're changing and. I think it's maybe something related to like graduating high school and I think so too, like going separate <laughs> ways kind of a thing, yeah. you know, the end of innocence kind of a thing. Yeah. Um I mean I just my favorite scene in the whole movie is when the kid's trying to buy alcohol or get it tries to get someone to buy him alcohol and it just doesn't doesn't go well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I really like that movie because it's like, you know, there's just something kind of beautiful about that that American idea of there's this you know this because that that was about his life in modesto where people are like you know they were street racing with cars and having fun. it's just it's just very you know it's it's a time we can't ever really go back to and we can't enjoy for ourselves yeah <laughs> yeah, we, yeah so we can just watch it exactly. um, and i'm just like you know this just that that um where everyone trusts everyone and everyone knows everyone it's kind of similar in this where we'll see later ever just like takes a guy's car yeah, he literally he, just takes a guy's car. Like, he just takes a guy's car. I think that I think they kind of allude to the family finding the car later, and they're kind of they don't know why their car's here, but yeah. they're kind of like, okay, it's good, and go home, everybody. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, and and you know, it's just stuff like that where people, because you know, um, in their world, they're like, oh, my car's gone. Of course, it'll show up later, probably. Um, why not? Because you, yeah, because you just think, well, that's you know, that's people don't steal in this world or. People don't whatever. Um, yeah, so I thought this fairly felt kind of American graffiti-ish to me, the way that, you know, these characters kind of existed in this world. Yeah, because on um, the flip, if Everett hadn't walked her to the switchboard, I think she would have made it there perfectly fine in this world. The danger yeah, totally. of the dangers of life or anything like that don't present <clears throat> themselves mm -hmm. until something weird starts happening. And yeah. then you start worrying about their safety when she's alone or when he's alone. Yeah. Yeah, interesting stuff. Um, so we see, yeah, we see Faye and Everett. She gets to the switchboard place. She switch. She takes over the switchboard. Um, and so he's on the radio, and she's basically taking calls into his station. Um, and then she gets this weird call that it's just like this sound. It's just this this persistent sound. And she doesn't know what it is, and she <clears throat> pretty much kind of calls around to other people like, hey, do you know what the sound is? Do you know what this is? Blah, blah, blah. And then she patches the sound over to Everett at the radio station, and he plays over the airwaves. And then uh, they get a call from this guy, Billy, 
And he says, you know, I've, I've heard that before. Uh, I was in the military and we, you know, there's this whole, this whole thing about what the military was having them do. And basically he says, you know, we heard the sound and we use a radar to indicate where it was coming from. And it was coming, it was coming from like the sky. It was coming from somewhere high above us. Um, yeah. So now, you know, at this point in the story, there's like sort of this mystery, like, what is this thing? What is the sound? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Billy tells them there's, there's a bunch of, they basically play phone, phone tag for a while. Like Billy kind of, um, like the phone disconnects and then he calls back. back. And, mm -hmm, they're like, Oh my God, we gotta find him. Mama. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, then he, Billy says, you know, there was, there was a recording of a similar sound before and it was taped somewhere. Um, and Faye is like, Oh, I, I think that there's a, there was a tape of that at the library. And so then Everett and, uh, and Faye go, they run off. Uh, she, Faye starts running. We'll see her run around a lot in this movie. Um, <clears throat> and then Everett takes the car and then they drive over and they get this uh, tape from the library. Uh, well, it's like a set of tapes. They have a whole bunch of tapes. Yeah. And um, they take them back to the, the, the uh, TV station. Uh, or the radio station and they listen to a whole bunch of these tapes and they find one that does have the exact same sound. Um, and then they experience a blackout. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So what'd you think about at this point, you know, the mystery, like, where did you think this was going? Oh, I was totally hooked at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, at this point I was just, I was worrying about them because in my mind, I'm like, what if they're luring it? Like, cause they're, broadcasting this, yeah. this noise and if it's mm -hmm. communication between ships or aliens talking to each other then what if because the blackout only happens inside the um the radio station so yeah. I'm like they're luring it closer um one of the things <laughs> that really that really freaked me out was when Faye's taking calls earlier in the movie and this lady's calling being like there's something on my land it's hovering in the sky mm -hmm. and then it cuts out um it, the, the movie gives you just enough to keep you invested and wanting to know more before it just takes mm -hmm. it away again. Um, yeah. And then before you know it, it gives it right back to you. And like Everett becomes invested almost as me, almost immediately as like the audience does. Like he needs to know more. Um, I also really like that they never actually call them aliens. At least I don't ever recall them in the movie saying these are aliens. That is, that is right. Um, they call them people in the sky or mm -hmm. things like that, but they never use the word alien because yeah. they're all still trying to figure this, this out. Yeah, totally. They kind of, they kind of allude to it. Like people say, Oh, there's something flying above my house. They never say UFO. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Maybe the term hadn't reached Cayuga, Texas at this point. Um, yeah, I'm wondering when, when did like the Roswell stuff really kind of blow up? I would have to do a Google search for that. Yeah. Honestly, I feel like I feel like it was. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Late fifties, early sixties. Yeah, yeah. I'm in the ballpark. Yeah, because yeah, you know, definitely. I mean, there. You know, I guess we can maybe talk about this now. But uh, in 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 2020, a year that's one of the craziest you can imagine. One of the things that had happened that no one really talks about is that there were there have been confirmed by the u.s government ufos like confirmed yeah, they were, but they were just like oh, it's fine though because everyone's out protesting no one's inside yeah. which you know again they people should be out protesting yeah but that's something that i also was just kind of like you know there's, there's aliens here like they are walking among us as well or something yeah, imagine like, being an alien though watching 2020 <laughs> i mean I look <laughs> if if you i yeah, I, I don't even know. I mean, if you if you are advanced enough to get to this planet, seeing humans is it's like it would be like seeing two colonies of ants fighting each other. It's just you, you just be like, man. It'd be multiple colonies of ants fighting each other. And you'd be like, <laughs> this is what yeah. you do. Yeah. I mean, not assuming they're 
<laughs> more civilized than we mm-hmm. are. We don't know what their power structure yeah. is or anything like that. We only assume what it is. Um, but personally, and my boyfriend and I have had a uh, disagreement <laughs> about this. I I believe aliens exist and that they are they are here and have been here for a very long time. Okay. Um, he does not. <clears throat> sorry, there's a big truck. Oh, sorry. Right. Probably coming from the shipyard. Um, also, I live near a naval base shipyard. Oh wow! I see some weird shit at night. I'm not gonna yeah. lie. <laughs> um, so that gives me a little <clears throat> anxiety. Um, but no, like I think it's. I think you know. I I am of the mind that it's narcissistic to think we're the only intelligent life out there. It might just yeah. look different. I'm yeah, very yeah, totally. minded to what it might look like. Um, I, I definitely agree that there there is almost certainly life in the universe. The universe is massive. It's massive. the The only thing is that, um, as far as you know, at least what they tell us. I mean, I I I'm one to believe what the scientists tell me. Maybe I'm a sheeple or whatever. But but um, they, as far out as we've looked in the universe, we've seen nothing so far. So in our local universe, as far as we can see, we see nothing. Um, there's been some weird, I mean, again, like in the last couple of years, there's been some weird stuff. There's this thing where they, they thought it was like a, a Dyson sphere. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I am not. Yeah. So, um, basically there's, there's this idea of a superstructure where you have, if there's a sun, you would create this, this thing that you create, basically you create a machine that can capture a large amount of the, the energy generated by a sun. So it would be like a massive um, almost like something encircling a, a sun. Um, and so there was this weird thing where they saw a sun, but there was this thing obscuring it. And so they were, they were thinking it was like a structure like that. They tried to investigate. They found that it was nothing, but you know, again, we're kind of seeing more weird stuff out there <laughs> that we can't really true. explain. It's very true. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like the idea of a colony theory that is kind of like, maybe there's a better term for it. I'm not sure that like it took them thousands of years to get here and now they're just here and they're, oh, sure. they're just hanging out. Um, Cause you know, like if we're going to send people to Mars or even further mm-hmm. out, it's going to take a freaking long time to get yeah. there. while you make these yes. massive ships and stuff like that mm-hmm. to um, generational ships, I think they're called or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, why couldn't something else have thought of the same thing? You know, it's not an original idea. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but yeah, they're here. Well, you know, I, I really like that you bring that up because that's actually the, if you, if you see what Arthur C. Clarke was trying to get at in 2001 Space Odyssey and sort of so was Kubrick. I mean, Kubrick put layers of, you know, himself on top of this. But the, the central idea of 2001 Space Odyssey is that some advanced civilization sends out these things these sentinels and that's what the uh obelisk is it's a sentinel and that's why every time a human touches it it sends a signal sending a signal back to you know the the home you know race that oh i found something and you know the 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 apes touch the thing sends a signal and then the then sends another one to the moon humans find it sends another one to Jupiter or whatever, and then the humans end up, you know, <laughs> in a little experimental weird thing, and then I guess whatever whatever you would believe happens at the end of 2001 happens. Um, but yeah, that's the idea. I mean, and people talked about like basically um, you would create self-replicating machines that just send them out into the universe, and when they find life or something interesting or some habitable planet, they send a chain of signals back to us or whoever the the propagator of of that thing is and that's how you would find life in the universe because the universe is so big so vast mm-hmm. how else are you tra- going to traverse all that all that space you'd have exactly. to send out and they can't always be man helmed or mm-hmm. alien helmed or whatever they have to be something that not isn't I don't know why I'm thinking of this but not immortal or but not not biological sorry that's the word I'm looking for yeah something that doesn't necessarily age the same way we do. Um, oh, sorry, the dog's moving. Oh, okay. It's okay. It's okay, Ellen. 
sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I think, I, I feel like it would make sense if they just sent out a bunch of ships that had a ton of mm -hmm. their kind on it and just have been out there for a long time. Also, we're probably not the only ones they've encountered. <laughs> Why would we be? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a massive universe. I'm sure there's a ton of stuff out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just gotta find it. Exactly. Um, okay, so, um, so yeah, so they experience this blackout and then um, I think Faye has to get back to the, the switchboard because she kind of left it <laughs> unmanned for yeah. however long she's been. That's another thing that's kind of funny about, you know, this time period. So she's unmanning the switchboard. So people just aren't, the call's not going through, yeah. right? So just imagine in our time, if you, if you try to go on the internet <laughs> and it's spinning for like 20, okay, 15 seconds, it's just spinning. The internet's spinning and it's not giving you the web page. How oh, mad dude, you are. Them, give them five seconds and it's spinning. Like we had a windstorm that knocked out our power at work for like an hour, maybe two. And our internet has not been the same since. Oh, I no. tried something. So I, at least once a day, someone asked me, is your internet down? Why isn't your internet working? I need to do work on my tablet. And I was, I'm a dick and I'm leaving soon, so I don't care. I'm like, well, McDonald's is right up the street. <laughs> they have free Wi-Fi. That's hilarious. I'm a terrible person. Yeah. Um, but, it, but, you know, it just it just shows, like, in this in this time, like, if things don't work, it's like, oh, whatever. I'll just keep calling. I'll wait. You know, I people are nothing better to do. The, yeah. the American flags now on the TV. I can't watch anything else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where yeah, at this time, like at like what six or seven o'clock, television stopped. It was nothing. Yeah, the Donna Reed show was over. They had done the news. There are no cartoons until seven a.m. So. Yep. So that's it. It go just says bed. stand by. Yeah, go to bed. <laughs> so. Yeah. Exactly. Read a book. Um, so Faye gets back and, <clears throat> um, she starts taking some calls and people are, you know, she, a, a couple of them are just like, you know, normal stuff. And then she talks to people her saying, Hey, yeah, there's something in my house. There's something above my house, mm -hmm. something weird's going on. And then later on they talk to this woman. And so she tells them, you know, uh, I, I know more, I can tell you more about what's going on with the lights in the sky. And she said, you know, and she uses the term, the people in the sky. And she gives them her name and address and she tells them to come over and she'll talk with them about what's going on, basically. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, well, let me just backtrack a little bit because I wanted to talk about, uh, so there's one, there's one shot in this movie that's really, really talked about. So it was like, it was like a shot where I think, so Faye had like taken a call or something and, and, and patched over the, the signal to Everett's radio station and the, and, and it was playing. And then the camera kind of does this, this long take that basically covers the entire town. It starts at the, at the, um, at the switchboard and then it goes through the town then it goes to where everyone's at at the basketball game goes through there then it goes out a window and then it goes all the way to wherever it is at the um at the radio station um so yeah what did you think of that that shot that that moment in the movie <clears throat> there's always this sense of them being watched because the the long shots generally like when everett and Faye are walking it's from behind um so there's always mm -hmm. this sense of pov from from the scenes that are the long takes. Um, it definitely felt like something was like watching them and being in there. It kind of gives you this sense of omnipresence or whatever, that something is definitely there and keeping an eye on them, you know, taking notes, checking things out, maybe looking for someone to take. Um, I loved it because the, the music definitely set the tone for it. You know, it yeah. was almost it was kind of playful at some points and it was kind of ominous at others. Mm -hmm. It was kind of nonchalant. It felt very scientific at some points, especially when it's like watching people. Cause it definitely felt like it was a presence. It definitely felt like it's a character that we're just not seeing yet. Um, I really liked it. I thought it was great. I, mm -hmm. 
I usually get motion sickness from things like that, like because it goes really fast at some points and then it suddenly just slows down. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, I felt very immersed in that. I couldn't look away, honestly, because I couldn't, I didn't want to miss something. I didn't want to miss whatever it might be looking for. Mm, okay, yeah. And the thing too is, um, you can kind of tell that basically uh, Faye and Everett are, they're like by themselves. Because mm -hmm. everyone else in the town is at this this basketball game. And everything else in the town is just empty. <clears throat> Very just isolated. Super empty. Yeah. Yeah, super empty. Um, and so, yeah, like you're saying, like you kind of get the sense that, you know, they're maybe being watched, they're alone, mm -hmm. they're isolated, there's something maybe coming and like, you know, yeah, it was, it was, it was, that, that shot's been talked about a lot, so. <laughs> it's very good. Mm -hmm. And also, like, I just had to appreciate the, the set, the set that they're on is amazing. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. it's very, very, very well done. Like, it reminded me of, like, old, um, like, those old Hollywood sets that, like, you mm -hmm. could go and tour for a long time, and I'm sure you probably still can, but it kind of reminded me of those, because Hollywood was full of those, like, back mm -hmm. lots of just set after set after set. Um, you could walk onto the set of Bonanza and then be on the set of the Rifleman or something like that. Um, which actually now that I think about it probably was the same set. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I really liked it. Cool. All right. Um, so yeah, so they, the Faye and Everett, they go to this woman's house. <clears throat> I think her name was like Mabel or something like that. Something. Yeah. So they go to her house and she tells them this long elaborate story about how there was a train a long time ago that ran through this part of their part of town and then everyone just was gone like they and they thought that you know they were attacked by native americans but you know they she someone she knew knew this one person who said no something else came and took people out of the out of the uh basically abducted people um and then mabel says her son was abducted and that these people in the sky, they come for uh, come to these small towns and they wait for everyone to gather and then they find people that are alone and they they take them. Yeah, they stay away <laughs> from big cities, big cities. I feel like probably because there's too many lights, there's far too mm -hmm. there's far too much of a chance for them to be seen. Um, and honestly, like these small towns, people go missing all the time, and it's very rarely solved. Um, so I like that aspect of things. <laughs> big cities i loved her yeah. whole story i was like yeah okay. i was like this I was like, more 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 <laughs> I, yeah i love stuff like this i really really do yeah yeah and so she was also <clears throat> so they so ever recorded like the whole thing <clears throat> and she started doing this incantation right she started saying some kind of thing she said, i'm not a witch don't worry yeah <laughs> but ever was a little freaked out you know um faye seemed to be kind of faye seemed to kind of believe her but ever it was a little skeptical um so yeah i mean <clears throat> after this happens he everett's like okay she's crazy <laughs> and so then they take off <laughs> so the two of them take off and uh they they get picked up by this other couple who they had sort of i think met before or talked to before where yeah, again they there's in from, like out of town and we're like oh we see it over the sky it was yeah. just outside of town yeah um and then yeah. they meet up with them again later after the old lady mm -hmm. incident. Yeah. And again, you know, another, this Americana, these random people from out of town, you just get in their car. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, sure. No problem. Oh Not yeah. Like, drive me here. Yeah. On the, on the rise right now or anything like that. Or yeah. <laughs> just, just Charles without, Manson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without, yeah. Manson, Manson F people up, man. <laughs> oh yeah. But also it builds this sense of small town trust. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, come on in. Have a hot cup of mm -hmm. coffee. So you can mm -hmm. sleep on the couch. We'll fix you up in the morning. Oh, mm -hmm. hey, I, my brother needs someone to do some work around his shop. Go and get a job, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, like <laughs> oh, that's another thing that Faye was talking about. We'd all be assigned a phone number at birth, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. really, like oh, that's just your social security number. <laughs> it's your social security number. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's this small town trust that is also not entirely dead. Yeah, but. It's not, it's on life support for the most part. Yeah, People for sure. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, think of this woman, Mabel, she calls into them. She tells them, come to my house. I left the key here and just walk in. Right. In the middle of the right. <laughs> Just things that, you know, just don't happen really anymore. 
Um, so yeah, but that, you know, that's, that's, I feel like that's one of the, you know, there's something intoxicating about experiencing that kind of stuff mm -hmm. in, in a, in a narrative. It's just kind of makes you feel good yeah. just to, just to sort of vicariously be in that time again, when everyone trusted everyone. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so they're in the car with this other couple and then, um, so, oh, one other thing I should mention, there was this other subplot that happened where, um, so Faye had to pick up, like, was it like her cousin's child, something like that? Um, no, it was her little sister, her, um, like, toddler little sister. Her oh, so friend, that was her sister? Yeah, her friend Ethel was okay. babysitting her, but then she couldn't get in touch with Ethel, and that's why yeah. she had to run back to the- She ran back, yeah. Because she couldn't get in touch with her, and she forgot to check on them. And she goes to the house to find her little sisters in her crib all by herself. The house is dark. She's fine. You know, the mm -hmm. baby's just, like, hanging out in her crib, being like, ooh. Um, mm -hmm. But no, it's... Um, and then they get... Yeah, and then they're wandering around basically with a with a toddler in her. Yeah, they're wandering. Around. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so Faye has this toddler now, and so Everett and Faye are in the car, and then Everett starts playing the the recording, and then the woman starts doing the chanting or whatever, and then <clears throat> it puts the driver to sleep. Like he just he starts to fall. He, yeah, 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 exactly. Both of them. Both of the two people. Yeah. That scene was so creepy. Like, when they're just like... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're on, like, a... Maybe not a highway, but they're on a main road. Um, mm -hmm. the, they're going mm -hmm. fairly fast. Because the old mm -hmm. lady wrote down the incantation and told Everett, say this to people that you encounter tonight. Because um, that's how the aliens, like, get you, is in your sleep. Yeah. It's a subconscious, like, radio message that we only hear when we're asleep. Um but he didn't take the note, but it had recorded her saying yeah. it before they entered her room. So he, I think his skepticism is kind of fading a little bit mm -hmm. and he wants to just test it. Mm -hmm. um, and the test results, you know, yield something kind of terrifying. <laughs> the woman was not making stuff up. Well, trust the hermit. The hermit is always right, guys. <laughs> the hermit is always on Kenobi. Yeah, he might have yeah. been a liar a little bit, but well, he's, he he right. said his version of the truth, right? Oh. From my perspective, <laughs> Darth Vader did kill your father. <laughs> from a certain point of view, <laughs> and from a certain point of view, maybe then I I chopped off Darth Vader's legs and arms. It wasn't. I never was did that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay, but anyway. Yeah. So they. Yeah, so. Yeah, the hermit is right. The hermit is right. And yeah, like you said, these people, they start looking up like they're in a trance <clears throat> and they're about to crash. And in 1950, whatever, if you crash, like you're dead, you're oh, dead. No seat belts. My mom remembers yeah. cars without seatbelts. Like it was every man, woman and child for themselves. Like, and those cars yeah. were heavy. Those are yeah. heavy automobiles. Like, yeah, American made steel, dude. <laughs> you're not yeah. going to come back from it. Um, yeah, you are not coming back um, because those cars were made to uh, protect themselves and not the people in them. Yeah. Uh, no whereas worries. our car, mm -hmm. our yeah. cars nowadays, you you crash the car, the car destroys itself to save you, mm -hmm. basically. Um, so then they he stops playing the thing. They wake the guy up, and the guy's like, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry." But uh, Faye, Faye, and Everett, they they get out of the car. They back. They're They're out. Yeah, no. mm -hmm. We're out. We're out. Um, and then so now we come to the climax. So they're out in the middle of the woods somewhere outside of town and um they they're just sort of walking around and then they see it they see these massive like close encounters looking flying saucer things i love the way the saucers looked i really really did and when it's revealed that that's just a small parish portion of a larger hole like the designers like blew me away, like absolutely blew me away with that concept. Like it was just, cause that's what I imagined they would be like. Like there was a little tear. There was a little, there was a little bit of a tear. Um, and I like how they're kind of lured in kind of like an anglerfish <laughs> lures in its prey kind of a thing. Um, mm -hmm. Because again, the anglerfish's lure is a smaller part of a larger hole. Um, and it's, it was, it was intoxicating. It was just, 
it was very alluring. It was very pretty. It's, you can see their minds getting blown <laughs> as you watch yeah. them and their yeah. reactions. Like, this isn't real, but this is real. I'm seeing it. How am I seeing this? This shouldn't be real kind of a thing because there's that, I don't know, there's that, I don't know if it's like a theory or something like that, but if you see something so unimaginable, like you will literally lose your mind, you will literally go crazy. Kind of like how a lot of H.P. Lovecraft's characters <laughs> yeah. go insane mm-hmm. immediately from the mm-hmm. horrors that they're seeing. Um, but yeah, it was it was really cool. I, I genuinely want to watch the movie again because I enjoyed mm-hmm. it that much. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, and so they they something happens to them, right? They're they're gone, and then we kind of get these shots of the rest of the town, and you know, Everyone, it seems the like aftermath of what? Hey, what is this? <laughs> Why is everything kind of off just yeah. a little bit? Um, I like to think they got zapped up. <laughs> I like to think they got scooped up, um, but there's also scorched earth everywhere, <laughs> mm-hmm. and just the tape recorder. But why would it? Yeah, the tape yeah. recorder at the same time. Um, yeah, that that was very interesting, right? I liked it. I think that they're, <clears throat> the only reason why I think they're alive is because you see the switchboard operate operators station and the lights still on. You see Everett's radio booth and the light comes back on. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's some kind of symbolism that they're yeah. still alive. Um, but yeah, I, it's a very open ended ending, mm-hmm. just depending yeah, they- on. How- cynical you are to <laughs> depending on what you might mm-hmm. think happened to him yeah i mean it seems like the the story the the film's kind of telling us that these these things are trying to take people somewhere for some purpose <clears throat> we don't know why but that's what they're trying to do and it's certain people get taken um and again yeah it's sort of very very similar to close encounters yeah and they're the most isolated honestly like mm-hmm. if they're going to take people who are alone they're in the middle of the woods by themselves <laughs> Yeah. Um, with no way to really get away. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And so then we kind of get this postscript again. It's it's sort of like this this whole thing is it's very again reminiscent of like a Twilight Zone episode. We get this like Twilight Zone s postscript, <clears throat> and then the the end credits is very. You know, they the, throughout there's been all this stuff where there's like you see a television screen or like it looks like they use this filter that makes it look like an old television. <clears throat> Like we're watching it through an old '50s television, and yeah, we get that at the end, and that's the film. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. So um, I know that you had said before, like you you really like certain you like films that have a good sound mix, yeah. and sound score. What did you think of the sound mix of this film? Oh, it, was, it was so good. I love the noise that the aliens produce. If that's, I don't think it's their mm-hmm. voices. I think it's obviously some kind of radio frequency that they use. Um, but I really liked that. I love the musical score. Um, yeah, the sound editing was very, very good. I liked it. I liked the rush of, like, that um, drone footage of it going through, like, the town. I liked you could hear a little bit of, like, the wind moving past it. Um, and then, you know, like, the sound of the um, the roar of the crowd, the squeakiness of on the from the sneakers to the basketball court. Um like just like the white noise itself of mm-hmm. like a crowd is really I really liked that. I thought it was very, very good. Yeah, I, I, I liked it too. I thought that was really good, especially like because a lot of this a lot of this um this film kind of plays almost almost like a play. Like there's a lot of moments where, you know, like the like this the the scene where Faye is doing the switchboard operating, it's like ten minutes or so uninterrupted of her just listening to calls, taking calls, moving calls around and stuff. Um, but yeah, throughout that scene, like there's a lot of like interesting sounds, you know, her yeah. switching the different knobs on the switchboard, the or sound of that. The cord and then plugging it in like that metal against, or that kind of metallic cord against like mm-hmm. a metal surface and then the plugging of it in. Yeah. It also is just a great way of building suspense. Like yeah, this was a movie that definitely built suspense scene by scene, mm-hmm. layer by layer. And uh, I love that. When suspense is done right, I it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there were so many good sound elements to this, for sure. Um, yeah, like you said, just the, the ambient sound, mm-hmm. the the way when, when, you know, the camera's moving and then you, like, hear something over here. 
or you hear, yeah, you hear the, the people playing basketball and then you hear the people talking and then it, but then it leaves and then it's like silent uh -huh. and then the score kind of picks in. Um, yeah, this had a really good score. I thought it was very, you know, it, yeah, like you said, it was, it was, sometimes it was eerie, but sometimes it was kind of like, yeah, it was like of, a calming mm -hmm. eeriness to it. Mm, that I yeah. Really liked. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this, it, that was pretty good. what do you think of like the directing style? Did you like the style that this director chose to like sort of, you know, um, yeah, tell the story? The way you said it was like a play. Um, I completely agree with, um, as someone who has been in plays before blocking is literally one of the most important parts of the flow of a play, because if you miss your, um, cue, it can, throw all the other actors off because you're relying on the other actor to be present when they are meant to be present. Um, and the shot of Everett and her going around, you know, just walking with each other, him playing with the, mm -hmm. the tape recorder, um, all the other characters kind of just running in and being asking him questions. Like everyone had to be on point, in, yeah. on time, no exceptions. And <laughs> I really, really like that, especially when they're like, oh, Mrs. So-and-so is looking for you. Mrs. So-and-so is looking for you. It's like, well, I'm trying to find her. Um, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. different interactions with people. And all the I can't imagine the, the amount of rehearsal that went into that before they finally started rolling a camera. Um, because it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah. There's a, a lot of dialogue from a lot of different characters. Yeah, totally. Um, and the dialogue, I have to say, is very realistic mm -hmm. it's these are problems mm -hmm. and issues real life people have that i think anybody can relate to you don't have to have been born in the, the 50s and 60s to appreciate mm -hmm. it because if you're from a small town you know how big something so minuscule can become yeah yeah like the the squirrel story the the chipmunk or whatever <laughs> exactly Everyone's heard that story, and we hear it like five times in the first exactly. twenty minutes. Yeah, imagine how many times a day they say it, they talk about it. We just get yeah. one <laughs> scene from uh, from the from their lives <laughs> talking about it. Okay, so what would you say? What was your verdict for this film? What was what was your rating? How how'd you feel about it? Oh, this is a ten for me. For me, okay. this is a ten. Like, <laughs> it had it. it it didn't get bogged down in any in too many subplots. They tie everything off, in my opinion. Um, I thought I can understand how some people would might think that Billy's phone call conversation, for as long as it lasted, might have been like gratuitous or something. Like that. But that's how old people talk. Old people yeah. talk for a long time, and I've been told a lot of different stories from a lot of different old people. This mm -hmm. is how they 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 talk. The only thing Billy didn't do was, oh, well, was that in 48 or was that in 52? Yeah. I can't remember. They do things like that. Yeah. Um, but they like to tell stories and they like to be heard. And one of the things I really like about Billy's story is this almost subdued earnest to get all of his words out in the right order. And mm -hmm. it almost sounds rehearsed, not because the actor rehearsed his lines, but because Billy has been wanting to tell this story for a long time to the right person, yeah, not somebody yeah. who already knows, not somebody who's been there, but somebody who can do more without having been affected by it. Because clearly mm -hmm. Billy's talking about being, <clears throat> having radiation poisoning. Um, yes. And that's what he's referring to, which actually I think some people in Roswell were affected by radiation. I'm like pretty sure that was a thing. Mm. Um, Curious. Yeah. I'm, it might just be another one of those stories. Um, but yeah, um, especially when he tells the part about like I, they didn't care because I was I was I'm black. Yeah, and that's why I haven't told my story, and that just mm -hmm. <clears throat> for the time period that's incredibly prevalent as well. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, in that in that story, he talks about they only hired people that were like black or Mexican or whatever people that they felt were disposable, basically, exactly. to do this and job, which they felt was dangerous. Exactly, and we still do that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like and that's the one of totally, the tragic totally. parts of it too. Um, but yeah, I, this movie was definitely a ten for me. Definitely. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So I'm really glad that we got to talk about this um, because so when I saw this the first time, I saw it like right when it came out. It was like pretty late at night, which was fun. Like I'm literally watching it at like midnight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but there was a couple things that for me didn't work. So I didn't. It. it 
so the the fact that it was sort of like a play kind of didn't totally work for me some things didn't keep me engaged enough i did like the ending i did like the score i did like the sound um but i it kind of felt average to me um so watching it the second time i liked it a lot more and you know there were more things that i liked about it there was more stuff that for me kind of stuck out that i that i liked that i was like okay you know this it the movie grew on me more Mm -hmm. um <clears throat> so the characters grew on me more the um the sound stuff grew on me more um you know thinking about the the americana stuff you know the fact that they're in a small town and it's very cute and fun that stuff grew on me i think the acting's really good too um they're both both the actors really did a great job and um yeah i i'm still not super in love with the film i wouldn't say it's like a 10 i'd probably give it like a six or seven but I definitely like it. I mean, there. This is one I'll, I'll probably watch it again at some point. Um, because yeah, there's you know, especially for like a story that's actually really very simple. Uh -huh. um, it's it's well done. It's definitely yeah. well done. And I, yeah, mm -hmm. I definitely got plenty of Twilight Zone vibes from it for sure. Though, like whoever I don't remember the name of the director who made it or the writer, but they definitely obviously have a very fond love of the Twilight Zone. And yes. Just that, just that it's not real, but there's that kind of side of you that's kind of like, kind of hope it's real, you know, um, <laughs> even if it is frightening. <laughs> um, yeah. Because it plays on that whole, we all have experiences mm -hmm. in our lives we just simply can't explain. Yes. We just, we can rationalize it, <clears throat> but we simply can't. I was driving, I used to live on a farm in the middle of nowhere. Um, where my closest neighbor was dairy farmer half a mile down the road mm. and there were no street lights you could see the whole sky the whole star all the stars everything i was driving down and i happened to just glance up and there was a giant bright light hovering there and i started slowing down and then all of a sudden it went like and it was gone whoa <laughs> i can't rationalize that yeah i simply can't um no idea what it was it might have just been gas in the sky i don't know i'm not a scientist um i can't explain that and i have a lot of other things that i can't explain and honestly sometimes it's just nice to wonder and yeah. not to have an explanation and just have this own personal experience that somebody might look at me and think i'm crazy but i know i, I don't drink I don't do drugs. I know I'm 100% sober and 100% awake. And mm -hmm. it definitely happens. Yeah, totally. I, and, you know, yeah, this totally plays into that. Like the, the mystery. Yeah, sometimes there are things that happen that, you know, there's like stories about this thing and then there's that and then you kind of investigate and then there's more stuff. And you, you know, the thing I like too about this film is like it, it, all of it is so kind of innocent and you know it doesn't it doesn't play it to be like a horror movie really uh -uh. it's really more like a suspense movie and you know the way that the ending plays out we're left to still kind of wonder what happened right there's still a mystery the mystery isn't yeah. solved by the end of it the only part of it that's solved is that yeah they're not alone <laughs> but yeah it just gives you a whole new mystery with the disappearance of Faye and emmett or not emmett ever everett yeah. and her little sister um, so yeah you have a whole new mystery to just yeah. wonder about yeah and you know like the woman was saying like oh I want to find him again so I can see my see my son um, so you know maybe you know someone could find these these flying saucers again and then find out what happened to these people maybe these people are still around still alive or something <laughs> yeah um well, they're definitely not, they've been there before, so they're definitely going to yeah. come back. Um, if you've never listened to the podcast Lore before, L-O-R-E, by Aaron Mankey, it's, it has all kinds of stories like this. All kinds of paranormal and crazy unexplained events that just nobody knows why or how they happen. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of them are ghost stories, but a lot of mm -hmm. them are um, rooted in that they have they have explanations towards the end. Well, because it was the 1890s, they didn't know Mercury was bad for you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
Also, everyone, why were they putting mercury in so many things? Like, when you find out what milk really was back then, this is why I don't drink milk. Oh. Like, it was so many, because they didn't have, um, what was it called? Basically, the things to purify food so that they get rid of the <laughs> toxins in them that mm. we can't normally digest. They didn't have that back in the day. So they yeah. were just eating all of these crazy things that it's amazing we are here today, just based on what we were eating back then. Yeah, um, yeah. But the podcast lore definitely has a bunch of things kind of like this that I think you probably would enjoy if you like like that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'll definitely check that out. It sounds cool. Um so um, one thing I was thinking about too is like I feel like this is a film where you could show almost anyone right like you could probably show like someone maybe I don't know 12 13 to yeah. someone who's 80 like it feels like a very universal kind of story yeah I think they only say that I don't think they only say fuck like once yeah. like Everett says it in a panic and that's it like there's very few there's hardly no swearing there's no nudity mm -hmm. there's no sex mm -hmm. there's honestly no violence either yeah there's no um, violence and the fact that i enjoyed a movie so much about any of those things is really great <laughs> <laughs> see guys yeah. it's possible to make a movie without boobs it's possible yeah you just gotta try a little harder <laughs> <laughs> okay. you just gotta try and you can do it um so yeah like you could anyone could watch this movie anybody could watch it and enjoy it i don't think you need to i don't think it's for you know, 18 plus, I think it's for anyone plus. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to like about this movie for sure. Um, and yeah, I'm really glad that we got a chance to talk about it. Cause yeah, I was, I was curious. Cause like, I've seen a lot of different opinions. Um, but I've definitely seen a lot of strong support for this film. A lot of people like it. I definitely so. know a few people who would like it and I'm going to be texting them about it. Be <laughs> like, if you have Amazon, you need to watch this. I yeah. might make Ryan watch it, honestly. Hey, yeah, hey, that, hey, down. <laughs> Off the bed. Don't give me that shit. <laughs> hey, sorry. <laughs> the driveway alarm's going off, so she thinks someone's mm -hmm. here, but it might just be someone leaving. Yeah. Also, my dog's a butthead. <laughs> yeah, right. Ellie. Okay, she's pouting. We'll be fine. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, I'm really glad that we got a chance to, to talk about this film together. <laughs> because, yeah, I was, I was very curious about what your thoughts would be on this film. And so I'm glad that we got a chance to talk about it because seeing how strong your response was kind of makes me think that this, this film, this film has an audience for sure. And this film, this film, like there's a lot to like about it and there's a lot to, you know, hopefully potentially the director will make more stuff like this in the future. Yeah. I would love to see, <clears throat> sorry. I would love to see what they do next. Um, I'm, I'm really glad you told me about it. I probably honestly wouldn't have heard about it or seen anything about it um, otherwise. So thank you for giving me the recommendation, honestly. Like, it's definitely what is going on my probably 100 sci-fi movies, if I've seen mm -hmm. that many. I probably mm -hmm. have. I just have to think about it. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. All right, cool. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, so that was our review for The Vast of Night. Um, Thanks a lot for listening in, everybody. And, uh, you know, we'll see you again uh, in the future with another awesome sci fi film. If I so. haven't been abducted yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, tonight you're going to see another one of those white lights or whatever. The shipyard is right there. Yeah. <laughs> I can throw this phone and hit it. <laughs> I hear crazy, weird noises at night. <laughs> Fun, yeah. You know, some of them are noise, some of them are maybe the aliens or whatever. Who knows? <laughs> The truth is out there. <laughs> the truth is out, right? <laughs> All right, guys. May the force be with you. Live long and prosper.